All right, I hope you'll listen <clears throat> real intently this morning. I invited the teenagers down. It's good to have you down this first Sunday of the year. I know you have your own little, not little, but you have your own church service uh, upstairs and downstairs with Brother Ben and Brother Shamron. I appreciate you taking us up on our invitation and <clears throat> joining us today in, in adult church. And we never, we never did kick you out, so to speak, or ask you to leave because of your behavior. It's just because the church got so big there wasn't room for all the teenagers in here and, um, and all the adults. And so I look forward to the day that we can get you all back in here all together every Sunday and, and not have you in a separate service. I, uh, I uh, miss having you in here. You bring a lot of, uh, especially you youngins ride the bus. And every Sunday morning, 99% of your neighborhood stays in bed and uh, lays there all night and lays there, you know, slobbering in their pillow. And you get up and you get dressed and you get on a bus, whether it's cold or hot or whatever the situation is, and you come to the house of God. And uh, my hat's off to you. I tip my hat to you. I'm lo I love you and I'm proud of you. And uh, I don't care what anybody else says. I think you're all right. Amen? And all right. So I hope you'll listen today. I believe tragedy can be averted and avoided if each of us here will to determine, determine to follow this morning's message. Now, I can't follow you around, homies. Uh, the reason my sons and daughters and wife have not fallen is because I followed them around. The reason Ben and Jake and Teresa and Alex and everybody, the reason they've not all fallen in a ditch somewhere is because I have followed them around. It's because I've stayed on them and watched over them and, and head knocked them when I had to. You say, well, what, you think your kids can't stand without you? Uh, yeah, they probably could have stood without me, but they would have fallen a whole lot more without me. Uh, lately, I've been... Um, when it's slick outside, and it's been slick a lot and icy and whatnot, this morning was, I went outside to start the truck before Mr. Jackson and I went to get into it, and the first step I took, phew, it was a long step. And my left foot came down before my right foot came down. I'd traveled about four feet and sliding, and so I spread salt and everything, and, and for uh, Miss Jackson and the grandkids were going to come out later, or for Jessica that was coming out later. But whenever I walk with Mrs. Jackson, she's had three terrible falls. Once she fell at a laundromat, she'd been drinking, but once she... <laughs> No, it was a front loader, and the seal was bad, and she stepped up on, she stepped up on it, and, and she slipped and fell, and originally hurt her back a long time ago, 82 or 83, I want to say 84 maybe. <clears throat> and then she stepped in a hole outside by the White's house when the state was put, or the city was putting in new sewers, and it wasn't, it wasn't blocked off, and it was night, and she stepped in a hole in herself. And then coming, coming out of a hotel in Gaylord, Michigan, about 4 o'clock in the morning, she slipped on some ice that the the roof, the heat of the roof, it was just the right temperature and it had melted the snow and it had dropped on, the, on an awning and it had formed an ice pool. You stepped out the door, it was dry, but as soon as you got out from under that awning, you just, it lost your feet and she, that was after she'd had the rods put in her back after her second surgery and she fell and cracked some bones in her back again and it's just been, it's been downhill since then. So whenever we go out, I don't have Miss Jackson hold my arm. Brother Nell, let me. Would you come hold my arm, baby? <laughs> and when, when we go out, we don't do it like this. Here, hold my arm. I, no, don't hold my hand. Hold it. <laughs> I want to hold your hand. No. <laughs> we don't do it like we're walking down the aisle at a wedding, like this, with Miss Jackson. Because if, if she, you don't do a good Miss Jackson invitation, <laughs> but, if, but if he slips, he's going down. And he might take me. When we go outside, I hold Miss Jackson like this. I grab her like the cops grab her. Yeah. <laughs> and usually it's with my left hand, and I grab her like this, grab her, boy, that's, you've been working hard. <laughs> grab that bicep, and I grab her, and I hold her just like this. So if she slips, she's not going down. She may slip, she may slide, but she's not going to fall. Why? Because I have her held up. And I'm watching how we walk, and I'm watching every step, and I know I'm not just walking for one, I'm walking for two. Like when you're pregnant, you're eating for two. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm walking, I'm not just walking for, does that hurt? I'm sorry. When I'm, when I'm walking, I'm walking for two, and I hold her up. Thank you, dear. Now, I'm fearful, I'm fearful that she'll fall, 
And I'm not going to let her fall because I'm not going to let her slide. And I'm not going to let her slide because I'm not going to let her slip. And I don't let her hold me. I hold her. And I know if she holds me, she could easily fall. But if I hold her, she'll be okay. And when I, I've, I've got a lot to say this morning. I'll probably say it quick. And, and I, you know, so I want you to follow me. But I want you to let the Bible hold you this year. Listen to me. Don't go around this year holding your Bible. Don't try and live the Christian life holding your Bible. Too many Christians try and go through life holding their Bible. You better let the Bible hold you. Amen. You don't hold the Bible up. The Bible holds you up. You, 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 the Bible's not resting upon you. You rest on the Bible. You let the strength of the Bible, the truths of the Bible, the principles of the Bible, the teaching of the Bible hold you up. You let the Bible grasp you. Because I promise you, as you go through life, you're not stronger than the Bible, just like Mr. Jackson's not stronger than I am. And you're not more careful about where you walk She's not more careful where she walks than when I walk with her. And God will hold you up. You don't hold the Bible up. You don't hold God up. God will hold. Now, you lift up Christ to the world, but God will hold you up. Now, I want to make three, state three statements, and then I'm going to back up and touch on every one of them. Number one first statement is any Christian can fall. Any Christian can fall. So don't, don't think you're above falling. Don't think, well, I'm the best Christian in the room. I've been saved 30 years. I grew up, my mama brought me to church when she was pregnant, amen, and I've been here every, uh, for example, Miss Anna, I just happened to look at Miss Anna, since before uh, uh, Junior and um, uh, Kayla, Kaylee, Kayla, Michaela, okay, uh, all these different names, man, uh, Michaela, I can't remember my own kids' names, so don't, Mika I can't even pronounce Callie for like four months. What kind of name is Cowley? Cowley. That sounds like Chinese, Cowley. <laughs> Get a normal name like Doug. Yeah, there you go. So, so Michaela, before, before Michaela was born, before Callie was born, before Brooke were born, and some of your children also, many of, many, some of you, you were in church before you were even breathing, you know, on your own. And you've been in church ever since. Don't think because that is your history or lineage that you, you're, you're impervious to falling. That you're not going to fall because you've been in Sunday school your whole life. You've been in church your whole life. If you hold a position in the church, don't think you can't fall. If you're the pastor, don't think you can't fall. If you're the uh, choir director, don't think you can't fall. If you, I don't, it doesn't matter where you are, how long you've been saved, how much you read your Bible. Pray. Any Christian can fall, statement number one. Statement number two, before we fall, though, or but, I don't like starting a statement with but, but statement number one, any Christian can fall. Statement number two, but before we fall, we slide. State number three, before you slide, you slip. Hence the title, slip, slide, fall. Any Christian can fall means me. Any Christian can fall means you. Proverbs 24, 16 says, A just man falls seven times, yet rises up again, which tells us a just man or a man who is justified, a saved man, can fall. Second Peter 3, 17, Beware lest ye fall from your steadfastness. James 1, 2 uh, fall into divers or many or different temptations. Hebrews 4.11, lest any fall. 2 Timothy 3.7, lest he fall. There's a list of men in the Bible who reads like a hall of heroes who have fallen. David was a man after God's own heart. Peter was the best Christian in all the world, and the first apostle listed in most every list, yet they both fell. Noah had enough faith to build a boat for 120 years, yet it never rained. Lot grew up in the best Christian home of that time as the nephew, surrogate son of Abraham, and yet he fell. Abraham was known as the father of the faithful, and he had enough faith to leave his home uh, and, and go off into his find, look for a city and a land whose maker and builder was God, and knew not whence he went, yet Abraham fell. Samson fell. Uh, uh, judges fell. Uh, Thomas gave his life in India as a missionary, and he, but he was martyred for, and martyred for Christ but he fell. John Mark, who stood beside the Apostle Paul in his last days in jail, he fell. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet and an Old Testament type of Jesus. Jeremiah fell and wanted to quit. Jonah fell and saw that. Somebody, I was looking at something the other day and somebody said, do you really believe, he was talking, to, he was an atheist, he's got an atheist, who would give their life 18 hours a day on the radio to pro promote atheism? Are you thinking stupid or what? Are you a total moron? What kind of freak brain do you have? You spend 18 hours of your day to run. Well, let me say this, and I've gotten some other points. Well, how do you know there is a God? Well, I'll answer your question as soon as you answer mine. What's your question? How do you know there's not? A bunch of skeptics and doubters and scorners and critics of my faith and Christianity skip you, your mama, your daddy, and everybody in your family hanging from your family tree by their stinking tails. Amen. Boy, you started off well, Pastor. 
I thought you said 04 was going to be better. 09 was going to be better than 08. It's going to be better, but it ain't going to be different. How do you know there is a God? How do you know there's not? If there's not a God, hey, don't, don't wake me up from this wonderful dream I'm having because my life's okay. If there's not one, good. I'm, I'm helping people, doing the best I can, love my family, love life, doing okay. But if there is a God, and, there, and you believe there's not a God, and there is a God, you're going to stand before that God on a fiery day of judgment. So when somebody tries to challenge or skeptic or doubt or mock or scorn or blaspheme or make fun or ridicule uh, uh, your Christian faith with a how do you, well, how do you know there is a God? Just be calm and kind and compassionate and, and, and polite and uh, humane and just answer back, I'll answer yours as soon as you answer mine. And if they say, what is your question? Say, how do you know there's not? How can you prove there's a God? How can you prove there's not? Well, evolution proves Evolution proves nothing. I'll stop with that. Simply saying, simply saying that uh, Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale. The, you believe that? Yes, I do. Well, the scientists have pro scientists prove nothing. Unless the scientist proves the Bible true, then the Bible proves the scientist wrong. I don't care what a, sci a scientist proved that a belly's whale, well, a whale's belly, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to hear it all. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. In fact, the Bible said it, that settles it, and I believe it. It's not the Bible said it, and I believe it, and then that settles it. No, the Bible settled it, says it, that settles it, and I choose to believe what the Bible says. Saul was the man of all men in Israel when he was the king, and yet he fell. Solomon was the wisest man in all the world, and yet he fell. And nearly every month, every week, we still hear of Christians who fall. Pastors fall, and missionaries fall, and evangelists fall, and deacons fall, and Sunday school teachers fall, and bus captains and bus workers fall. And I think it ought to be, I believe this too, wake up, I think it needs to be just as shocking when a Sunday school teacher or a bus captain or an usher falls as is when the pastor falls. Everybody falls, oh, the pastor fell. I think it should be just as worrisome and just as troublesome to a church when the Sunday school teacher falls. When the bus captain teacher falls, the bus captain falls, or the usher falls, or the Christian school teacher falls, or the Christian school kid falls. We, we think, well, the Christian school kid's a dime a dozen, and the usher's a dime a dozen, and we can replace them, but we can't let the pastor fall. In God's eyes, we're, none of us are replaceable. We're all replaceable, but none of us are replaceable. And God doesn't want a one of you to fall, not a one of you to fall. And the Bible says plainly, if we do these things, we shall never fall. Simply saying, the possibility of falling is here for every single child of God, and the first word is fall. But a long time before a Christian falls, there's something else they do, and that's to slide. Psalm 26, verse 1 says they slide into sin. Psalm 37, 31, steps are sliding. Look, folks, we don't all of a sudden fall into sin. Before you fall, you slide for a while. Jeremiah 8, 5 says Jerusalem is slidden back by perpetual backsliding. Slidden back and arrived in a state of... I wish I'd had that verse last week. I just got it this week. Jeremiah 8.5. Uh, Jerusalem has slidden back. She's arrived. Jerusalem has arrived in a state of apostasy and permanency, a state of being backslidden. Why? By perpetual, unchecked, unchanged, unchallenged backsliding. If you continue to backslide, 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 you will arrive at a state of being backslidden. And if you think you'll snap your fingers and click your ruby slippers together and hit the altar and all of a sudden be all fixed up again, you're dead wrong. Right. If you turn your back and turn your back and turn, wait, look up here, nothing going on over there, nothing going on over there, it's all happening right up here. Right. Get your mind under control and look right up here. You're not going to click your ruby slippers and all of a sudden be back in Kansas, Dorothy. You're going to keep on perpetual backsliding, perpetual backsliding, perpetual back backsliding until one day like Jerusalem, you're going to arrive at the condition of being backslidden, which is almost impossible to recover from. Deuteronomy 32, 35 says, their foot shall slide in due time. The fall is the last part of the slide, but if you don't slide, you won't fall. The fall is when you wreck, maybe wreck, or ruin your life and hurt your family and take other people down with you. But this is another thing that happens. Brother. Now, you go ahead and go through life and just go ahead, slide, slide, slide. Hey, there's somebody hanging on to you. Grab me. There's somebody hanging on to you. 
You just go through life, just sliding along, sliding along, sliding along, hanging all that all the time. And when you fall, you're going to take somebody down. Right. Maybe right. mama bear, maybe baby bears. That's, there's, a, there's a reason Pastor Jackson tries to walk guard around his soul. There's a reason Pastor Jackson tries to walk guard. Because I don't want to take anybody down. When, if I fall, when I fall, I'm not planning on falling. But if I fall, I don't want anybody here to go down. Right. I, would hope so. I, I, would know, I would know some of you would not fall if I fell. You'd be hurt. You'd be cut. But some of you would fall if I fall. I watched the ball game yesterday. Uh, IU was behind by a few points. And they gave the ball to a guard. And at first, the guy takes the ball, and at like 15 and a half seconds left, they're down by four. They weren't going to win, but they played hard. Guy takes the, takes the ball, a little dude from, I think, Carmel, named Moore. He, he gets the rebound, or they, he hits the second shot. Iowa hits the second free throw. They bring it in, in line, pass to the guard. He runs up. The first thing he does, man, he runs all the way down the court and goes into the corner. Okay, so you have the inline as a defender, you have the sideline as a defender, and he's got about a seven, you know, six foot ten guy guarding him. There's four of the guys on this team. You ain't the only one point guard, but he goes into the corner, he picks up his dribble, all of a sudden the big man comes out, six foot ten, he tries to skip pass it over to one of his players, and the ball's stolen, and the game's over. Five men lost because one man ran to a corner and picked up his dribble. I don't believe as, as a Christian, if I was his coach, I'd let him have it. I told him right then. I wouldn't have been all good try. I said, how many times? I mean, you think a guy's playing college ball has ever been coached in high school, yes or no? Yes. You think his coach in high school or junior high or PUE or Power League ever told him there's one defender, two defender, three defender, in line, sideline, defense, don't go in the corner and pick up your dribble. Have you ever been told that, Zach? Don't go in the corner and pick up your dribble. Did I ever tell you that, Jake or Ben or Dave, or you guys who play ball traps? Don't go in the corner and pick up your dribble. But that's what he did, and the whole team lost. Why? Because of one guy. You don't have the right, just like that point, and I'm not against the kid. You know, he's probably a good kid. You don't have the right to walk along and slide, slip slide, and fall and take others down with you. You don't have the right to do that, sir. You don't have the right to do that, ma'am. You don't have the right to do that, teenager. I don't have the right to do that as a pastor. You don't have the right to do it to cause others to fall who are holding on to you, hoping and trusting that you won't fall and take them with you. It's not your life to live like you want unless you live on an island all by yourself or you're a hermit in a mountain in a cave. If you have other people that count on you, you don't have a right to fall and bring others down with you. See, the fall is the last part of the slide, but if you don't slide, you won't fall. And the fall is when we wreck and hurt our life and ruin others' lives. But before the fall comes a slide. See, the apostle Peter sl slid into sin before he fell. Long time before he fell, he was sliding. Jesus said, how's, how's that go? Let's think about it. Jesus said uh, many chapters before the, the night in the garden, somebody will betray me. And Peter said what? What did Peter say? It won't be me. Jesus, somebody going to betray me. And that, let me say this, and, and, and I don't want to be insulting anyway. But some of you, right now, well, it won't be me. Well, it probably will be you. If you think it was, and, and, and hey, I don't want to be smart. I'm trying so hard not to be smart like you. But if, if a person can sit in this church and know me and know my manner of life, my conversation of life, and if I'm willing to say, hey, I could fall. I know I could fall. I watch myself because I could fall. If you think you're better than I am as a Christian, if you think you're better at fighting the battle than I am, if you think you're more up on the wiles of the devil, if you think you've been through more hell and temptations and opportunities to quit, change, go someplace, if you think you've been through more than me as a Christian, you're, number one, you're wrong. Number two, if you, if you don't think I think I can fall, then you dead better sure you think you can fall. Amen. You're not sit there and think it can't happen. And maybe some of you sit there and say, I don't care if I fall. Well, then, then man, what's wrong with you? You don't care if you fall into sin? You don't care if you walk up and stand before Jesus and you have nothing to say to him? And he says, what do you do with your life? Well, nothing. Why? Now, you smart off to me if you want to. You can turn me off and not come back here. You can, you can look at me and really think about something else. You want to think about football. You can do whatever you want. You can look at me and give me your mind, give me your eyes, but not give me your mind. You can do that if you want to. But the day you stand before God, you're not going to be able to, like, change the subject. You're not going to be able to change the channel. You will give an account of yourself. And God says, well, where, how come you didn't listen to that sermon when he talked to you about not falling? Why didn't you listen? You go, oh, no. Hey, that works for six-year-olds when they, when they get in the peanut butter and get in the cookies after mama told them not to. That works for little boys and little girls. But that's not going to work for you or I in the day we stand before Christ Jesus. Well, we don't know. He's not going to accept that as an answer. Right. I don't know won't cut it. He's going to say, you don't know. Well, let me give you a few ideas. Because you didn't care. Right. You didn't care. And I guess when, I don't know what he's going to, maybe he's going to hold out the wounds in his hand and say, you didn't care about this, did you? 
I promise you'll care then. So you know what I do? I care now. So when he holds out those hands, say, you did care. And I'm going to say, yes, Jesus, I did care. And I want you to say the same thing. I'm not mean. I'm not mad. I'm not uh, an ogre. I'm not a grouch. I'm not uh, 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 contentious. I just recognize the fact our sinking sun is fading fast. I'm 50 years old. My life is 75%, 70% over. That's if I live to be 75. Man, dude, if it's 70% of the ball game's over, you better get in a hurry up offense. You better get with it, Jack. You better start stroking. You better get going. And we don't have time to go through life just fall, get up, fall, get up, fall, get up. If you don't want to fall, then don't be like Peter and don't begin to slide. And when Jesus said, somebody will betray me, Peter said, not me. And when we say, it'll never happen to me, it's about to happen to us. It'll never happen to me, it's about to happen to you. Jesus is praying in the garden. He says, watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. And here Peter is sleeping when he should have been praying. And young men, young women, teenagers, adults, when you leave your prayer life, you're sliding. I don't know what your prayer life is. I don't know how much time you spend praying every day. I don't know if you spend two minutes, five minutes, half hour. I guarantee you, if you keep falling into sin, you're not praying. Watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. Well, I tried. It didn't work. Okay, so you're right, and God's wrong. Let God be true and every man a liar. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Once you get into temptation, the chances are slim that you'll resist temptation. So watch. Keep your eyes open. Watch out. And pray that you enter not in temptation, and then you won't enter in. Well, preacher, I just get into temptation all the time. Do you watch and pray to enter not in temptation? When you leave your prayer closet, you're headed for a fall. One of the first steps to falling is when you slide, and you're sliding when you stop your prayer life. Say, so, preacher, I just sin, and I feel dirty, and I don't feel loved, and I don't even want to approach God. Then go to God with the Bible verse that says, if we confess our sins, just admit that you're guilty. He's faithful and just to cleanse us our sins and forgive us, to all, forgive us of all our unrighteousnesses. The Bible's true yesterday, the Bible's true, true today, and the Bible's true tomorrow, and Christ will forgive you. Don't stop praying because you've been sinning. Go to him and get forgiven. You would better pray, and you better pray every day, or you're on shaky ground. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to read the paper. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to play basketball. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to watch football. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to hang out with your pals. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to lift weights. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to wrench and, and throw in some you know, new pistons in your, in your rod. If you don't have time to pray, then you don't have time to do much. You don't have time to sleep if you don't have time to pray. If you don't have time to pray, well, I just don't have time to pray. Then stop making time to eat. I know my face looks mean and mad, but I'm not mean and mad. I'm just concerned that every single year people fall. Before they fall, they slide, and before they slide, they slip. How did Peter fall? First he slid. You know, that can't happen to me. It might. Sleep when you ought to be praying. It might. Follow far off. Get away from the action. Stay away from church. Don't get away from the action. Get close to the action. He sat down with the enemy, warned by the devil's fire. Watch. So many things. I should turn this into a month-long series. I should just stop there. How do you get your heat in your life? Warming? By, maybe I will. I don't even care. I don't have to finish this sermon today, do I? Warming by the devil's fire. How do you get the heat in your life? Uh, and don't say it's a furnace. How do you get heat in your life? Drugs? Alcohol? What? What heats you up, man? Come on, let's talk sex. Fighting? Rock music? Making money? Sleeping? Movies? What? What gives you heat? Peter, warned by the devil's fire to get heat. That's why we've got so many of you young people. So many of you young people. How do you get the heat in your life? Where's that heat come from? Where do you get your juice? Where do you get your hops? Huh? What gives it to you? You better, I'll tell you where you better get it. I'll tell you where you better not get it. The devil's fire. The devil's fire. You better get it from God's word, God's fire, God's embers, which never go out. Set my soul on fire, Lord, with thy holy word. Burn it deep within me. Set my soul on fire with the word of God. Is it preacher, you got hops? I don't know, you tell me. Preacher, you got juice in your life? I don't know, you tell me. Yeah, I got, ju I got enough juice running over. I was talking to some guy the other day on the phone. We just laughed, laughed, laughed. I'm like, dude, look, let me tell you how to get a woman. 
And I mean, I talked to him, we laughed. I said, dude, I'll turn you, I'll turn you into a player. Just hang with me, Holmes. I will hook you up. He's like, dude, where'd my preacher go? What happened? I'm like, no, I'll do it the Bible way. I'll do it the right way. I'll tell you how to romance her and everything. And I'm, I know what I'm talking about. Sorry to tell you, but I, oh, I know what I'm talking about. Where do you get your heat, folks, making money? Where do you get your heat, driving fast? Where do you get your heat, relaxing? Where do you get your heat, smoking weed? Where do you get your heat? Where does your heat come from? It better not come from the devil's fire, because if it comes from the devil's fire, you're on your way to being to falling. Amen. I tell you. What else did Peter do? Well, he thought it couldn't happen to him. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. He was following afar off. Isn't it funny? Nobody goes, if they can afford it, nobody goes to the Super Bowl and says, well, give me a seat way up there where you can't see anything unless you have binoculars. Everybody says, man, give me a front row seat. Would you like two front row seats of the Super Bowl, or would you like a row in seat 365, row Z, section, uh, you know, M? Oh, man, I want two seats on the 50-yard line, row seat one and two, row A, section A. Yeah, if you could have your choice. Then why is the football fans will paint up blue and white and go to the Colts game and put, you know, Colts think, horseshoes on their forehead and go scream and cry and cheer and fall out and spend $500 on a game. And Christians don't want to get, they want to follow far off. Not me, Jack. I always want to get right into action. I, I, ever since I was little, I want to be right in it, right in the middle of the concert, a rock concert. I want to be right on the floor, festival seating, right up there in the front where every sweat's going and rock and roll's happening and joints are passing, and that's where I want to be. I want to be right there. I want to be right there where it's loud and rubber's burning and gas is burning and, and uh, nitrous is burning. I want to be right there. I don't want to wear earphones. I want to be right there where it's at. Well, if that's the way the world is, why can't Christians, why aren't Christians that way? Why have we got so many teenagers you want to follow far off? Well, I want to follow far off. Let me say this. Watch. Parents, don't get upset with me. Do you know why so many teenagers follow far off? Because mom and dad follow far off. So they look at mom and dad and go, well, see, mom and dad follow far off. You know your teenagers are usually right about where you are spiritually? Oh, boy, that's good. Now, we're fortunate enough to have teenagers and young people that are further along than we are, then praise the Lord for it. Don't pat yourself on the back for it. Praise the Lord for it. But most of our young people are right where we are spiritually. If you're hot for God, they'll be hot for God. If you're serious about Christ, they'll be serious about Christ. Right. If you keep rearing and ask questions later when somebody demeans the name of Christ or criticizes the church or criticizes the preacher, they'll kick names and they'll kick rear and take names later too and bow up like a stinking weightlifter on a stage somewhere. Hey, don't talk about my preacher. Hey, don't talk about my preacher. Hey, don't talk about the Bible. Hey, don't talk about Jesus, you're usually, your kids are right about where you are spiritually. So if you got problems with your children spiritually, go home and ask yourself, where do I get my juice? Where do I get my heat as a Christian? Right. Amen. Right. Wow. Well, what else caused Peter to fall? Well, he said it couldn't happen to him. He was sleeping when he was praying. Followed afar off. Sat down with the enemy. Had lunch with the critics. Sat down, those with, uh, uh, sat down with those who don't believe in God sat with those that hated Jesus instead of hanging out with the soul and apostles. He warmed, warmed by the devil's fire. He denied Jesus in his time of need. He denied the faith. He denied the church. Man, somebody asked you where you go to church, tell them Three Years Baptist. Get one of those stickers that Condon's got and slap it on your car. Amen. TRBC, what's that stand for? Three Rivers Baptist Church. I don't have anything against the Methodist or Presbyterian or Brethren or Assembly of God. I, got, I have nothing against anybody, but I want to be what Jesus was. First church in the New Testament was a, church, was a Baptist church. John the Baptist baptized Jesus by immersion. By immersion. You go to a church that believes in once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. And saved by faith and not by works. Saved by faith, kept by grace, and not by works. Amen. Amen. Go to a church where it's organized and it's properly at a run and where the whole mission is building up Christians, uh, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, getting people saved. Now, if you can find a Methodist church like that where they baptize by immersion and the preacher's got some oomph when he gets up in the pulpit. Uh, Sean and Carissa told me that they went to say goodbye to a pastor and he went there, and I, I'm going to say it in public, I don't mind. I wish you wouldn't have went because I don't care if the dude never cared enough to get you saved. And we talked about it. He even wondered about that. We sat and talked about because I thought your kid got mugged, but it wasn't your kid anyway, so we talked for a while. And uh, 
He said his kid came home. Somebody told him a few weeks ago his kid got mugged in Sunday school. And so his kid got off the bus. He was telling his kid, look, son, it's okay. You know, we're going to be good, but stand up for yourself. You got to defend yourself. And the kid's like, what are you talking about, Dad? He's like, well, if somebody put snow in your face, you got to stand up for yourself. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about, Dad. Nothing like that ever happened, you know. So, oh, it didn't? Well, praise the Lord for that. But I went to see Sean. He wasn't here last week or something because he was so, uh, 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 he felt indebted to a pastor that they had for years. And so they went to say goodbye to a pastor who was leaving to go someplace else. And I asked him, did he ever, man, did they ever push salvation? They ever tell you I get saved? And Sean said, no, you know, it's something I had to ask that guy. And I said, not only should you ask him for the sake of knowledge, but he might not be saved himself, Sean. He may, be a young, uh, he may have been a young man who was mistaught, who grew up, thought he wanted to do the right thing, got in the ministry, but nobody ever told him how to go to heaven. Churches are full of them. Full of them. Don't, don't sit down at the devil's fire. Don't warm at the devil's fire. People that fall far off end up denying the faith, denying the church, and denying Jesus. You tell people you go to TRBC if they ask. Tell them you're glad you do. Tell them you want to get there. Tell them you want them to be there too. Don't ever be ashamed of going to an old-fashioned Baptist church. Then what did he do? He cursed and swore. Man, he cursed with Christ in earshot. Just like Christ in earshot every time we curse and swear, or you curse and swear. Then he went back to the old life and the old business. Now he's fallen all the way to the bottom. But he didn't fall to the bottom. He slid to the bottom, and he never would have fallen if he hadn't been sliding. Now, are you on a side today? Or are you on the side? You say it can't happen to you? Are you on no prayer life? Are you falling afar off? Are you warming out the devil's fire? You getting your, you getting your heat from what the world, what the devil provides, a bunch of thorns and cracklings? Are you, you sitting next to that Yule log, amen? Are you warming out the devil's fire? Are you sitting down with the enemy? All your best friends, you're hanging out with the people that are enemies of Christ. And the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. Pretty soon you might deny Christ, deny the church, deny the faith, curse and swear, and go back to the old life. Hey, look at Lot. Lot fell. Lot fell as far as a man can fall. But 20 years before the fall, he was sliding. sliding. What did he do? He looked at Sodom, pitched his tent towards Sodom, moved into Sodom, See, he didn't leave Uncle Abraham and Aunt Sarah and move into Sodom and start calling all the Sodomites brethren. First he looked towards Sodom, then he pitched his tent in the area of Sodom, then he moved into Sodom, then the Bible says he became of Sodom. So he slid a long time before he got to Sodom. Here came some queers. I'm going to keep using that. I don't like the word queer. I don't care if you like the word queer. By the way, let me say this too. If you defend a queer more than you defend the man of God, you, I doubt you're saved. I wonder if you have the Holy Spirit inside you. Well, preacher, I promise you, I guarantee you, don't look at me sideways either because that doesn't scare me. I guarantee you, I've knocked on more homosexuals' doors and told more homosexuals, Christ loves you, Christ will save you, Jesus died on the cross just like he died for you, more than most preachers have, more than most members of this church all put together. So if I say queer, queer is something's not normal, queer is something not right, and if a person is a homosexual and they prefer men over women, they choose men over over women, they are queer. Not gay, queer. Now, I don't use the word fag. You can if you want to. There's something queer is knocking on the door. A bunch of queer. Look at me. You want to fall in 09 or you want to be kicking rear in 09? That's going to be our motto. Kick and rear in 09. That's my motto since 81. Amen. There's some queer. <laughs> Bring those men out that came into your house, Lot. Right. There were angels that came to warn him. God sent angels in prayer in answer to Uncle Abraham's prayer to warn Lot that Sodom was going to be destroyed. So the so the lookout, the, 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 the homo lookout, the lookout with the new flesh, and the sweet flesh. Right, one of them. Watching them, seeing them come into the city, they see them going to Lot's house, and they come in there. <laughs> And Lot comes to the door and says, y'all, what's up? He didn't say that, though. He said, brethren, what can I do for you? Right. He said, bring those men out that we can know them. Didn't he talk forth? They meant know them in a sexual way. Right. And, and Lot says, oh, brethren, do not so wickedly, for these men have come into my house for safety and sanctuary. Here, he said, I have two daughters that have not known. I have a Sarah and a Jesse. I have a Lydia and a Claudia. I have a Brooke and Bridget grown up. I have a Callie and Kirsta. I have a, uh, I have a, a, a Jayla and, uh, and a Audrey. I will bring them out to you. 
and you do with them whatsoever you think is okay. Are you kidding me? For after I see Jesus, mom and dad, I'm fine a lot. I'm kicking his rear end when I get to heaven. Sorry, punk. Two daughters that have never known men, so they're chaste and they're pure and they're virgin and they're holy and they're precious and they're right, and you're going to bring your virgin daughters out to some sodomites that they can desecrate their bodies. You stinking punk. But what God's name's wrong with you? So I would never do that. I hope you wouldn't, brother. But that's what Lot said 20 years before he did it. Amen. Filthy wickedness. Lot didn't sit down one day and say, I think I'll give my daughters to a bunch of queers. But then you know what happened? God let them run out of the city. They went to a city and they dwelt in a little cave. You know what his daughters did? They all got drunk. One night, one daughter went in and laid with her father Lot. She became impregnated with her father. And the next night, the other daughter went in, and she became impregnated with her father. And that's where Ammon and Moab, or the Ammonites and the Moabites came from. Incest. I mentioned that in church a few weeks ago. I had some people used to come to church here. You don't know who they are. They came for a while. They came for a long time. But they're a blended family, and they just decided that whatever. I don't know what they got upset about, this, that, and everything. Whatever. I talked to them. I've been to see them. I've been over backwards. I've been to the hospital. I've been to their house. I've given them money, everything. They ain't not come back to church. I don't care. If, I, it wouldn't matter to me if they were here this morning, I'd say it. I said, well, aren't you afraid you'd offend them? But listen, you come to church once in two years. There's not a whole lot else I can do, right? You're pretty well offended already. Something's wrong with you already. If you do, Well, you finally got them to come after two years. Eh, they ain't not going to be back in two more years. They said, well, that's being critical of people, preacher. No, I'm not being critical. I've been doing this for a long time. And I know, I know what I know. And so, you better get back in church. No, we're not coming back. You better get back. Well, this, that, and everything. Everything's always coming up. Everything's always coming up. Well, how'd that all end up? A, well, I'm not going to say, a little girl, sex, intercourse with her 15-year-old brother, incest, sat in our pews, faithful as can be, whole nine yards, whole enchilada. And that would never happen to me. Yeah, I bet you if I'd told them three years ago, that'll happen to you. They'd have punched me in the nose. It's not going to happen to you, though. Guess what? You're sliding. I mean, you can get mad if you want to. You're sliding. Lot didn't say, I think I'll give my daughter some queers, and then if that doesn't work out, I think I'll get them pregnant. No. He fell, but first he got on the slide by pitching his tent towards Sodom. Now, where's your tent pitched this morning? Where are you on the slide? Somehow, get it, we will not face the fact we're just like the men in the Bible. You're just like the men in the Bible. And, and, and I'm going to quit in a few minutes. I know it's warm in here. Brother Rick, turn the fans on. Brother Alex. We're just like the men in the Bible. George, you're just like I was when I was 16. Now, you can turn out, I say it all the time, you can turn out like my brother Andy, or turn out like my brother Tony, or turn out like my brother David, or you can turn out like their brother Bella. Now, you choose. Yeah. Your choice. Right. Be any way you want. Right. And I love all my brothers. I love the one in the pen. I love the one that's lost his family. I want the, I, and I love my brother. Y'all, I love my brother, David. I'll talk bad about him. I don't want you to. But, but I'll talk truth. But you choose, because you're no different than me. Right, sir. We all think we're different. Oh, those were some old-time guys that wore robes. That's why they were a bunch of guys that wore robes. <laughs> Road camels. Well, we wear clothes and smoke camels. What's the difference? <laughs> We're just like the people in the Bible. They were put there for examples, the Bible says in Corinthians. They were examples to us how not to fall. David slid before he fell. Abraham slid before he fell. Uh, 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 Lot slid before he fell. Nobody falls before they slide, and nobody slides before they hit a slippery place. What happens before you fall? You slide. What happens before you slide? You get on some slippery places or slippery around some slippery people. Slippery habits. Boy, I wish I could get inside all you kids. Mom, you just, I don't know, man. Walk around with your fist held up. Come on, preacher. Your jaw clenched. You're going to say something about God? I don't care where you are. I don't care what high school you're in. I don't care what you're saying to my mother, boy. <laughs> I can't make you do it, though. Because I can't make you do it, I can't force you to be a separated person. Well, everybody I'm not, I don't give bells about me. Oh, well. Yeah, right. Well, I need to give an education. Oh, well. Well, I need to give an education, really. Show me the Bible. Amen. Listen, I have school. 
I graduated with a degree in education. Show me where getting A's and B's is so important. You got to ask you what you got on your report card. Got to ask you how you lived your life. Right, right. And all that going to school and all that keeping the rules. But I just wish there'd be something in us that would that would rebel against people who try and pull us down. But we want to be popular. We want to get you know, We want to be accepted. Right. We want the cool kids. You give me the kids that commit suicide and get them into by the time they're 25 years old. What kind? What are you talking about? The kids that what kids are you talking about? Can you look down? slide. Don't slide if you don't want to fall. Before you slip, the Bible says in Psalm 35, 6, their way is dark and slippery. Psalm 73, 18, the people were in slippery places. And if you don't want to fall, don't slide. If you don't want to slide, stay out of slippery places. Highways all over our nation have bridges and highway signs. It says careful, slippery, bridge, or it, it gives us signs to let us know. It doesn't have signs on the highway that say, uh, careful, don't fall in the ditch. Right? Careful, don't drive into the ditch. It says, careful, slippery. Why do they tell you it's slippery? Because they don't want, they want you to be aware, slow down, be cautious, whatever the case may be. Because if you don't slip, you won't slide. And if you don't slide and lose control, you won't fall into the ditch. You think churches, hey, listen, you think churches, the highway department knows, if you don't slip, you won't slide. If you don't slide, you won't fall. And they try to keep you from wrecking by warning you about the slippery spots. And that's exactly what this sermon's all about, to keep you from the slippery spots, to keep you from falling. But the satanic method, the God's method, is to keep you from slipping so you don't slide, so you don't fall. But the devil's method is, don't worry, you won't fall. It's okay to get slippery. It's okay, you won't fall. It's okay to get around slippery people, slippery comments, slippery subjects, slippery jokes, slippery places. Hey, it's slippery places. Don't go around it if you don't want to fall. You preacher, I just don't see why you preach against the world so bad, so hard. I'm not trying to keep you from falling, folks. I'm trying to keep you from slipping. That's why I preach about rock music and your internet surfing. 90% of what you do on the internet is not fit for human consumption. Amen. Too much difference now between this book and Christianity and the world to spend our lives snuggling up with the world, hanging out with all the backsliders and the critics and the scorners and the negative people and the playboy crowd and the soap opera crowd. You say, well, that stuff won't cause me to fall. Maybe not, but slippery places cause you to slide. And when you start sliding, you're apt to fall. I'll not ask, but I'm sure half of you who have been driving for any amount of time, you've been in an automobile that's, that's maybe hydroplaned or slid, and you know the sudden fear, all of a sudden, whoa, I don't have control of this vehicle. 
Uh, Miss Jackson and I were Miss Jackson and I were up going to Michigan, or on, we were in Michigan, and there was a car way up in front of us, and just up in the North Woods, and a car all, went to pass another car, and all of a sudden that car, let's see, it slid this way. The rear of that car just started going like this. I mean, they, they were doing 70 miles an hour, just started sliding down the highway, started spinning down the highway. I mean, the middle of an interstate doing 65 miles an hour. Traffic's real slight up there. That's why I like driving because there's not much traffic up there. And <clears throat> it's easy to drive and not a lot of passing and in and out stuff. But, but that car started to spin and it ended up cars around. There was only a few cars actually around it. We were behind it. It had a bird's eye view. It spun three or four times. And then it, somehow, I don't know how, God's hand was on it. It ended up backwards facing us in the, in the slow lane going backwards. So finally it stopped. We started slowing down when we saw it. And that car just, we walked and we finally, I mean, we drove by and looked at the people. We were probably doing about 40 when we went by and looked at both the people were just, you could just see fear on their face because they realized what could have happened. Why is it as Christians, we start slipping, we don't get afraid? Why is it as Christians, we start slipping, we don't get afraid? You better get just afraid like those people because you could very well end up slamming inside of a tree and being DOA. Let's bow our head and close our eyes, please. Say, preacher, I won't slip. I won't fall. Now, you might not fall, but if you start slipping, you're bound to fall. And if you don't want to fall, don't slide. And if you don't want to slide, stay away from slippery ground. It seems to me if all falls are the result of sliding, and all sliding comes from slipping, then our lives should watch out and beware of the slippery places. Now, you're here today. The Bible says a lost man their foot shall slip in due time. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, you're on standing on a slippery place right now, and the next step is a slide straight into hell. One step twixt you and death, and after death the judgment. So point on a man wants to die, and after this the judgment. You're a young person, you're a teenager, you're an adult. You've never trusted Christ as Savior, then today's the day. You need to come forward and have Brother Ben or Brother Shaman or Brother Renell take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you can go to heaven. If you've been saved and, and you've never been baptized, and today's a day. Today's a good day to be baptized. Caleb is, and others should follow the Lord in believers' baptisms. Maybe you ought to join a church like this. If you're not a member of a church, join a church where they're going to preach not just against falling, but against slipping and sliding. And maybe you're a young person, you're an adult, and you, you know in your heart that you live in slippery places. And if you don't want to fall, then you get out of those slippery places. You use an altar today, this first Sunday of 2009, the first Sunday, the new beginnings of a new year, and you ask God to help, and you let that Bible hold you up this year, and you keep from falling. Slip, side, fall. Brethren, if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, whatever the Lord said to you today, have the courage to do it. Just have the, have the faith and the love and the, and the desire and the, and, the, and the want to to respond to the invitation. Are you lost? Need Christ? You come. Just take a moment. We'll show you what to do. Are you saved? Never been baptized? You come. We'll show you what to do. Need a good church to join? You come. It's a good church. I recommend it. And if you're saved and baptized, member of the church, struggling, slipping, slipping and sliding and falling, you come. Use the altar day. Ask God to help. And let that Bible hold you up this year. The girls will play. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. Head bowed. Eyes closed. Come on.